Okay, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Anita and Jeff uh, for organizing um, this wonderful event and for giving me the opportunity to talk in this occasion. Um, my friendship and collaboration with Fred started uh, around 1989-1990 and I must confess that in the beginning both of us had some doubts whether it will work or not. So uh, Fred organized a sabbatical together with me and uh, Dasat Ghani and so on. But nevertheless, it uh, came out to be very successful and we are collaborating now for 25 years. Not as long as Jeff and Fred, but we are getting close. Um, so since uh, these days, uh, our friendship and collaboration actually depends, uh, I would say, from day to day, from year to year. And we still have many, many um, programs and ideas for collaboration uh, for many years to come. And um, probably many of you of CUNY knows that Fred is living now for 14 months and he's coming actually to my, man, to my uh, lab. So, um, like many of you uh, mentioned here, I learned from Fred so many things uh, from his deep insight into science and his incomparable skill of writing and of, from his uh, methodological and uh, very careful approach to both carrying out research and also to summarizing and writing it. Um, I have been also very much impressed by his genuine love of science, not, you know, by getting more fame, more publication, but actually loving the subjects, getting enthusiastic about results, and so on. And something that is not mentioned, and maybe I am original in this, that he is so humble and so nice person, and in Yiddish we say that he is a really uh, mensch. Um, in addition to that, uh, in the last 25 years, uh, Fred was almost in every critical step in the uh, development of my scientific career. Uh, the first point, very difficult one, was in 1990 when I was up for tenure and of course uh, Fred helped me with encouragement and support and this was really um, very helpful and very encouraging. And then of course uh, later on fighting with the NIH to get support, writing grant proposal and so on. And for all this support and from, for all that I learned from Fred, I am very grateful from him. And I must admit that I still have many things to learn. So I hope we will continue our collaboration and friendship for many years to come. Thank you. So now to... Yes. Okay, so the subject of my talk has been already mentioned, and this relies heavily on collaboration with Fred. Uh, Fred was synthesizing together with uh, Boris many of the peptides uh, that were used in these studies, and they were really challenging uh, peptides. So, uh, so the first slide uh, describes the mechanism of HIV binding uh, to its target cells. So um, the HIV uses the envelope spike to bind to the target cell and to the mediate the fusion between the virus and the target cell. The envelope spice consists of uh, three GP120 molecule and three GP41 molecule that are held together by um, non-covalent interactions. Initially, 
uh, GP120 binds to CD4, a molecule that is found on the target of T cells and macrophages. After binding to CD4, um, the envelope spike undergoes conformational changes that expose another binding site to chemokine receptor that are present on these cells. Uh, this can be either CCR5 uh, chemokine receptor or the CXCR4 chemokine receptor. And the, whether the, the virus binds to CCR5 or CXCR4 determines the phenotype of the virus. The most important phenotype of the virus is the one that binds to the CCR5 receptor. And this phenotype is called uh, R5 viruses. And they are uh, responsible for infection in uh, most cases. Um, so, um, HIV can be neutralized by antibodies that I that are targeted against important epitope on the virus. However, unfortunately, the virus has developed many mechanisms uh, to escape from the immune system. This includes um, many mutations, but also the hiding of the um, most important uh, neutralizing determinants. Um, so the only way actually to completely eradicate HIV is by developing an effective vaccine, but this has been proven to be a very difficult uh, task. Um, it, however, it has been demonstrated that uh, if neutralizing antibodies are present at high enough concentration, they can prevent uh, HIV infection. The sole target for HIV neutralizing antibody is the envelope spike, and this can be either the GP120 molecule or the GP41 subunit. Uh, other proteins of HIV are not important for vaccine development. Um, the envelope spike, in principle, contains many, several targets uh, for vaccine development, and among them is a region that is called the V3, which is the, the third variable region of GP120, the external envelope uh, protein. Uh, the V3 has turned out to be uh, the major, a major component of the binding site for the uh, HIV co-receptor, which can be, as I mentioned before, CCR5 and CXCR4. And the uh, recent structures by uh, Ray Stevens suggest that the V3 actually binds into a pocket that is formed by the uh, transmembrane helices of these uh, GPCRs. Um, the sequence of the V3 has been found to determine whether the virus will bind to the CCR5 co-receptor or to the CXCR4 uh, co-receptor and thus determine the phenotype of the virus. Uh, however, to, pr to protect the V3 from HIV neutralizing antibodies, uh, the virus uses several different mechanisms. Uh, one of them is that the sequence variation in the V3 between uh, different viral strains. And uh, just for an example, I will mention that in a single person, there are more HIV different strains than all the influenza virus strains in all the population of the world since the beginning of the discovery of the flu virus. So in one person, there is more variation 
than what has been found in influenza virus since its discovery. So this is really a very difficult task. Um, moreover, the V3 is masked by different uh, loops of the GP120, and it become exposed only after the binding of the envelope spike to the CD4. So in many cases, especially in viruses that we are calling them um, neutralization resistant, the V3 is not exposed and become exposed only after the, the virus is already bound to the target cell. And then steric indrance prevents the antibodies uh, from reaching the V3. Uh, glycosylation also serves for masking the V3 and other uh, neutralizing determinants. Uh, it has been known for a while that uh, immunization with GP120 elicit a large proportions of antibodies against the V3 region. However, these antibodies are capable to neutralize uh, viral strains that are relatively easy to neutralize, but, not, but they are not good enough to neutralize uh, more resistant viruses that are called uh, field isolates. Uh, it has been shown also that V3 peptide uh, can be used to generate anti-HIV antibodies, and therefore V3 peptides are potential candidates for a HIV vaccine. However, so far, uh, when linear peptides were used for immunization, the antibody neutralization, the virus neutralization was not uh, strong enough. And our goal during our studies uh, was to improve this uh, neutralization, probably by, um, hopefully by constraining the V3 conformation to the conformation of, of this region in uh, native GP120. Uh, and this is because linear, flexible, linear peptides are flexible in solution and they can elicit uh, antibodies against different conformation. Some of them are not similar to the native conformation of the V3. So to design a constrained V3 peptide with the hope that they will elicit more powerful uh, HIV neutralizing antibodies, we need to, uh, to know the structure of the V3. And when we started this, was, this project, this was around, uh, actually I started work on this project around 1992. At that time, the structure of GP120 was not known. Uh, the first structure was uh, published in 1990, 1998 by uh, Peter Kwong and Wayne Hendrickson. And in this structure, all the variable loops were eliminated, including the V3. So the structure of the V3 was not known for a very long time. So our idea was to use uh, antibodies that were directed against the GP120 and that are targeted against the V3, and then studying the complexes between these antibodies and V3 peptide and determine the conformation of the V3 peptide when they are bound to these antibodies. Um, and along the years, we studied uh, two different antibodies, one of them is the 0.5 beta antibody, which is a mouse monoclonal antibody raised against GP120. Uh, and this antibody is very strain specific and it neutralizes efficiently only the HIV1, 3B strain, but not other strain or the virus. And the second antibody, you already recognize it from the uh, talk of Mark Dumon, and this is the 44752 antibody. It is a human monoclonal antibody that was developed by uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Susan Zola Pazner from NYU. Uh, it was isolated from infected 
patient and it uh, uh, neutralizes a relatively broad spectrum of HIV isolated isolates, including R5 and X4 viruses. So uh, I am NMR spectroscopist, and we are using NMR to, to determine the structure of proteins and peptide bounds bound to these proteins. And as you know, the antibody molecule is very big. It has a molecular weight of 150 kilodalton, too big for uh, NMR studies. Uh, even the FAB fragment is too big, and what we use for our studies is the FB fragment of the antibody. And when we started, methods were developed to express the FB fragment of antibody in E. coli, and this enabled us to carry out our NMR studies using this FB fragment. And for NMR studies, we have a panel of different techniques. Uh, they are called isotope edited experiment, isotope filtered, and also the transferred NOE experiment that we used in the past. However, the transferred NOE is suitable only to study relatively uh, weak binding or moderate binding. In our case, the binding was very, very tight, so we had to use either the isotope edited or the isotope filtered experiments. And this is a demonstration how this technique can simplify the spectrum and get information about the bound peptide conformation. While on the left side you see uh, the 2D spectrum of the complex. Uh, on the right side you see the isotope filter nosy that shows a cross peak due to interaction mainly in the bound peptide and also interaction uh, between the peptide and the antibody. Uh, using this technique, Vitaly Tugarinov in my lab determined the structure of the V3 bound to the FE fragment of 0.5 beta, and we were the first one to show that the V3 adopts a beta hairpin uh, conformation. Later on, Vitaly went on and solved the structure of the entire complex uh, using multidimensional NMR techniques. Uh, the isotope edited technique gave similar results, however it is more powerful because we can uh, spread uh, the spectrum on the right side also to a third dimension and also to get the C-alpha, C-beta chemical shift, which are indicative for secondary structure. So um, later on we used mostly this isotope edit uh, technique to study the bound with the conformation. So overall, we studied a structure of three different uh, V3 peptide bounds to these uh, two antibodies. Um, the V3 bound to 0.5 beta, and three different peptide bound to the 447 uh, antibody. We see that in all cases, uh, the V3 peptide adopt a beta helping conformation. However, this uh, conformation uh, differ in the register of the hydrogen bonds uh, within the V3. So while all the peptides that are bound to 447 are similar in the register of the hydrogen bonding, there is difference in the register of the hydrogen bonding uh, forming residue in the peptide bound to 0.5 beta. So this indicates that we have like two different, slightly two different conformation of the V3 when it is bound to neutralizing uh, antibodies. And we found that they actually relate to each other like a mirror image. So if you look here, all the antibody that are bound to 447 have very similar topology. The one that bound to 0.5 beta relates to this topology like a mirror image. Uh, we found that the 447 antibody interacts mostly with a trio of very conserved residue, a lysine 305, a isoleucine 307, and isoleucine uh, 309, while the uh, 0.5 beta antibody Uh, 
that is shown here, intervals with arginine 308 and glutamine 310 that are very variable region, very variable residues. And this may explain why the 0.5 beta is strain specific, while the 447 antibody is more broadly uh, neutralizing. Um, so after we solve the structure uh, of V3 bound to 447, Peter Kwong solved the structure of V3 containing GP120. And initially, uh, the structure was slightly different from our structure. Um, but uh, a year or two later, he solved another structure, and then his structure came out to be very similar to our structure. Uh, Peter Kwong's explanation was that one is before CCR5 binding, one is after, but if one looks very carefully at the structure, the reason for this may be more crystal packing forces and the antibody that was used to bind GP120. Nevertheless, this caused us a lot of trouble with the NIH reviewers because some of them mentioned only this structure and they t said, okay, your structure is very different from Peter Kwong, so whom should we believe? They didn't relate to this structure, but I hope as Fred, as you, someone mentioned here, you fall down, but then you have to give a fight back, so hopefully we will give a fight back, you know, in the next few months. Um, anyway, all these structures gave us some guidelines about developing constrained peptides that can be used as useful immunogens. Um, and we know that all that the V3 adopts a beta helping conformation. We know something about uh, the hydrogen bond network and we know that we can uh, induce this hydrogen bond network by um, using disulfide bond. So maybe I'll skip this. So um, there are several positions in which we can uh, put the disulfide bond, and this will determine the hydrogen bond that are formed uh, within the peptide. So the, the stars, are the points of the disulfide bond that can be created by replacing the residues with cysteine. And these are the hydrogen bond will, which will be formed, another disulfide bond, and uh, so on. So we didn't know in the beginning which disulfide bond will be good, so we had to try uh, different options. And um, so although we were using two disulfide bond, we, were, we could mimic very well the conformation of the V3 and get very good RMSD deviation between the structure of the constrained peptide and the structure of the peptide when they are bound to the antibody. The affinity of this peptide constrained by two disulfide bond to the 447 antibody was relatively weak. When we constrain the peptide only with uh, one disulfide bond, we can get better affinities, although the mimicking was not as good. And we vary uh, the position of the disulfide bond, and we, are, we were found peptide that uh, bound to the 447 antibody even more tightly than the linear peptide. So this is the, the KD for the linear peptide. There is one here, one here, one here, and one here that binds even more tightly, but still not something very uh, dramatic. Uh, we use these peptides for immunization. These are 43 peptides uh, with a disulfide bond. This was a very major challenge for uh, Fred and for Boris Arshava and I'm very thankful to Boris as well for the very skillful peptide synthesis. Um, and indeed, when we immunize rabbits with uh, these peptides, we could find that this, the, the immune sera uh, interacts with uh, GP120. And moreover, we can find that the anti-sera 
uh, neutralize HIV of different strains, and the strains are linked to the bar. So this is the linear peptide, and this is the dilution. So to neutralize, for example, the SF162 strain, we could go up to 83-fold uh, dilution. However, with the linear peptide, this one, we could go to more than 2,600 dilution, which means that the immune response was much stronger in uh, neutralizing HIV. So all these, uh, these strains are relatively easily neutralized. This strain is very difficult to neutralize, so no one wonder we didn't get any neutralization. And this is the control. So we didn't get any neutralization of the control. Um, these are more difficult to neutralize uh, HIV strains. By using linear peptide, no neutralization was obtained. However, by using the optimal linear peptide, we could get some neutralization of these more difficult to neutralize HIV-1 strains. So, uh, also, the neutralization was not so sensitive to the sequence of the V3 in the strains that are being neutralized, uh, as long as these strains are defined as relatively easy to neutralize. So we can see that the, while we had the consensus sequence here, the one that was used for the constrained peptide, it could also neutralize strains that have three mutation, four mutation, three mutation, and even up to six mutation in the V3. Uh, and this chart shows you how much the uh, constrained peptide is better than the linear peptide. With the constrained peptide, we could neutralize this SF162 strain by 2,600 fold dilution. However, with the linear peptide that is here, we could neutralize it only with uh, up to 83 fold uh, dilution. So, as I mentioned before, the problem with more resistant viruses is the V3, that the V3 is hidden by the interaction with the V1 and V2 of the same GP120 molecule and also from adjacent GP120 molecule in the envelope spike. However, when we use CD4 mimic peptide to, to bind to GP120 and to expose the V3, we can see that there is synergism between the CD4 mimic and the um, HIV neutralizing antibodies that we got by immunization. So if you see here, like the CD4 mimic peptide can neutralize HIV, this strain, uh, at a concentration of 0.237 microgram per ml. The serum alone can neutralize at uh, 94 dilution. However, when we use the combination, uh, we can uh, use much higher dilution, almost 900, and the concentration drops also by uh, tenfold. So the, if we use this CD4 mimic to expose the V3 and then hit them with the neutralizing antibody, this can be uh, maybe a viable uh, method uh, to treat uh, HIV infection infected patients, but NIH has uh, higher uh, standards and higher goals, and they want to achieve antibodies that can neutralize HIV uh, without using additional compounds, and so far um, this has failed. So finally, uh, we have shown that the beta helpin conformation is a common fault for the HIV V3 loop. Um, we show that the V3 can ad adopt two different types of beta hairpin conformation, uh, and that the V3 peptide 
can be constrained to a conformation that resembles the native beta helping conformation and getting much stronger HIV neutralizing antibody response. Um, um, and this optimally constrained peptide can raise uh, HIV neutralizing response against a wide spectrum of HIV isolates, given that the V3 is exposed in these uh, HIV strains. So I think this is one, as far as I know, maybe the only study that shows really that constraining peptides to the native conformation can improve so much the um, capacity of antibodies to neutralize the pathogen. However, the case of HIV is much more complicated, and therefore we still have not developed a vaccine against uh, HIV. So this, this is the list of all the people who collaborated uh, on this project, um, especially I would like to mention Fred. I didn't list it, list it here, of course, Boris Arshava, and I'm sorry for that. Uh, Susan Zola Pazner gave us the 447 antibody. Shuzo uh, Matsushita, the 0.5 beta antibody. And uh, Tali Sheriff also helped us in setting up many of the NMR exper experiments and maintaining the 800 NMR spectrometer that it will, be ru it will be running almost every day. Thank you very much. Thank you for this nice piece of science. Uh, probably one question. Yes. Hi. Uh, so I was struck by your, your beta hairpin because the alpha factor has a beta hairpin turn also, which, which is a pro -gly. Yours is gly, pro -gly, apparently, at the beta turn. So uh, years ago, Fred synthesized a constrained analog of alpha factor that contained a beta lactam bond rather than disulfide. So have you considered other ways of constraining your peptide to get perhaps a better antigen? May I add one thing? Probably uh, instead of a cysteine, if you put the alkenyl and azido function and you do the prototypical click reaction, this is quite simple and probably it can give you uh, some flexibility in terms of uh, the length of uh, the carbon chain that can in a certain way modulate you your... This to <laughs> so it's only... Huh? Because Ask him, <laughs> what is your answer? <laughs> I thought I wasn't going to be on the spot till later on. Uh, one of the things that we did in the design was we looked at the structure of a lot of beta hairpins in, in proteins, and we found that very often at certain positions, it was the disulfide bond that was most acceptable to maintain the geometry of the, the conformation of the beta hairpin. Whenever you start putting in non-natural types of constraints, there's always going to be some impact on the conformation. And then it just becomes a question of making a lot of different peptides and seeing which one has the uh, best function. In this particular case, <clears throat> you're dealing with a very long peptide to begin with. So, to make libraries of that is, and, and to do all the types of tests that we do would be a very, very large project. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <laughs>